Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel. Even better, spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so there's somebody I watch on, on YouTube. He has, He's the Garage Band uh, YouTube thing. He likes to say, tickle that uh, like button on your way by. Anyway, it, it, just, it makes me crack up every time he says it. All right, Montepulciano. When you hear that word, what do you think of? Well, many people, including many in the industry, don't realize there's a duality to this word. It's both a grape name and a name of a town, and neither is directly related to the other. But you see, the grape Montepulciano is mainly found in the Abruzzo along the Adriatic coast. It can produce fruity, almost sweet tasting, quaffable, inexpensive reds. It can also produce a delicious rosé or light red called Cerezuolo. And it can also produce expensive, age-worthy wines. In Toscana, aka Tuscany, we also have the town Montepulciano, located in the southern part of Tuscany. It has been around since at least the 3rd or 4th century BC. It grew in importance over the next 1,000 years or so. In the 1500s, its importance politically declined. However, it has remained important agriculturally. Wines from this region are called Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, the noble wine of Montepulciano. The main grape here is, well, Sangiovese, known as, locally known as Pugnolo Gentile. It's typically a blended wine with a minimum of 70% Sangiovese, 10, 10 to 20% Caneolo Nero, and small amounts of other local varieties such as Mamolo. In Tuscany, we have three major areas of Sangiovese-based wines, Chianti, Brunello di Montalcino, and Vino Nobile, Vino Nobile di Montepulciano. Vino Nobile, typically, sometimes say, people say Vino Noble, um, uh, but Vino Nubile typically comes across as a somewhat comes across as somewhat in between Chianti and Brunello, at least to me. It also has extra rusticity the others tend to lack. Frescobaldi. If you know Italian wine, then this name should be familiar. They have a very long history. It starts with the estate Tenuta Castiglione uh, in the hamlet of Castiglione in the Val de Pesa in the 11th century. Val de Pesa not Pisa, by the way, but Pisa, I believe, is in the Val de Pesa, uh, is southwest of Florence, and the estate itself is near the Chianti Montespertole DOCG. I mean, it's literally like right on the outside of it, like you, you're seeing it right now. Uh, it was a farm in the 11th century. It wasn't until 1300 when the estate became the origin of the family's history in winemaking. Also, during the 11th century, the family is established in Florence. This is the beginnings of their dominance in the merchant guilds. If you watched my um, episode last year about Chianti, um, then we kind of talked about the guilds. They began as cloth merchants and eventually became bankers. They financed many European royal families, with the English kings being among the largest. This lasted for about 300 years until the early 1300s when Politics got involved and the family's interests in England were effectively confiscated along with other merchants and resulted in, well, bankruptcy. Luckily, they had their fledgling wine business at the time, but more than that, the family also boasts several literary figures and musicians since then. And through their wine production, continued their connections with European royalty. But it really wasn't until the 1800s when the family's wine history starts becoming important with the financing of modern winemaking and the introduction of Chardonnay, Merlot, and Cabernet Sauvignon via their in-law, Vittorio uh, degli Albizzi. We then fast forward to the late 20th century with Vittorio Frescobaldi expanding their wine business, notably with their partnership with Robert Mondavi. Eventually, their holdings grow to include 11 wine estates, mostly in Tuscany. This estate is a more recent acquisition, having been purchased in 2021, with the current name Tenuta Calamaya starting in 2022. Yes, this wine predates that, but its release is from after 
but its release is from after the purchase. Something that does happen in the wine world more often than you may realize. It's not like it's super common, but it's not rare either. The first vintage under this name was 2019. Now, I took a little digging, but I found out it was formerly called Corte alla Flora, which was owned by Sergio Prenote, a businessman and former president of the Lazio Football Club. It's located in the Montepulciano region, which the family has a previous connection via Leonardo di Niccolo Frescobaldi, who was the mayor in 1390. Their website also lists him as, quote, an explorer, writer, and merchant. It's 70 hectares in size. The vineyards are arranged in a circle around the hill of Monte Liscone at an elevation of about 300 meters or 984 feet above sea level. The soils come from the Pliocene era, 5.3 to 2.58 million years ago. The soil content is mostly clay. Pugnolo Gentile, the local variant of Sangiovese, is the most planted grape here with small amounts of Merlot and Syrah. Notes on the vintage are that there was limited rainfall in the winter of 2020. However, there was ample water from rains at the end of 2019. This was important due to the high temperatures that occurred in June and August of 2020. Most of the growing season was characterized as ideal, hot, dry, and slightly windy days, with no rain at harvest, which helps preserve high quality. Now let's get the stats for this wine. The 2020 Frescobaldi Tenuta Calamaya Vino Nubile Montepulciano. Average price online, what I found was $38 to $39. It's from the Vino Nubile Montepulciano DOCG. It's composed of 90% Prugnolo Gentile and then 10% complementary red grapes. Uh, probably the aforementioned Merlot and Syrah. Aging, 24 months in oak barrels, no mention of type and age. ABV, 14.5%. Let's get into the wine. All right, I'm excited to do this. I don't drink enough uh, Nobile, Vino Nobile. So um, I'm always excited to give give this great, give this wine a try, this region. It was a really uh, difficult cork to get through. And like I said, you know, you have Chianti and Brunello. Chianti tends to be uh, kind of on that lighter side, um, but delicious. And Brunello and its younger cousin Rosso tend to be uh, bigger, bolder, darker color type of thing. Uh, comes from the Brunello clone or Brunello version of Sangiovese, hence the name Brunello. Um, and then Vino de Biele tends to be kind of like that in between, and it tends to have a little more rusticity. This is super hard to get out. This cork really, really... Wow. I also may need to, no, that, that, that feels pretty good. Over time, so, okay, you ideally should be cleaning this Corvin a lot more than I do, cleaning the, cleaning the, not just the outside, but the inside of the, of the needle. But over time, as you puncture corks, there's a lining that will wear off. And that usually helps with the cork getting, you know, putting the needle through the cork much easier. Um, so I might need to replace the, the needle, just per, just saying. All right, <clears throat> so let's uh, give a look at the color. Nice deep red, a little ruby going on. It's pretty much all the way through the edge. Um, Sangiovese tends to brown faster, tends to oxidize faster. This is what again, it's a 2020, so we're at three years um, since harvest. Uh, probably wasn't bottled for a while, so we're probably not at three years in the bottle yet. So um, it still is holding its color. Um, I'll, I'll find Sangiovese, Tempranillo, Nebbiolo in that three-ish, four, more five years. It kind of depends on how long it was in a barrel and before it got into a bottle. But um, it tends to show that orange oxidative, at least on the, on the color-wise, pretty quick in that three to five year window. Uh, good staining on the glass. So we got lots of extraction. All right, let's check it out. Uh, what was it, 14.5? I mean, looking at the legs, I, I'd agree, it's medium plus uh, to high on that. Great aromatics, fresh. Um, 
it's got some really lushness to it. Um, something I wasn't really expecting, but it, I don't, I, I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, of course I know what it is, wouldn't necessarily be thinking Brunello uh, level if I knew what the grape variety was first, you know, ahead of time. It's definitely, you know, it definitely smells like San Giovese. You got some tomato leaf, you got some uh, herbaceousness going on here. It kind of smells like a pasta sauce, a little oregano, thyme, blackberry, raspberry, more black fruit uh, than red fruit going on. It's got a dustiness to it. It's got what I call accordion case, leather felt dust, um, which is very characteristic of Italian wines. I'm not saying I don't get dustiness in other European wines, but there's a, there's a, a particular characteristic of dustiness. Um, it comes more into play with Sangiovese, Nebbiolo, and then Corvina based wines. So Valpolicella, Amarone for me, especially if mean, I had an Amarone at Easter, it had absolutely just classic accordion case on it. It was fantastic. Thank you, Joe, for uh, giving us that bottle of wine at, uh, at lunch on, on Easter. Uh, if you don't know who I'm talking about, Joe, uh, he owns Luce. Old school, old school interview with him and Jeremy, uh, who's also awesome with Italian wine stuff. Um, put a link below so you can check that out. Yeah, I mean, a little bit of tar, a little bit of rose. Rose is a little bit dried out, more petals. Yeah, and a lot of this stuff is really subtle. Uh, I'm also looking for it because I know what's in the glass. There's also a bit of cocoa, a little bit of chocolate. So um, that might be coming through from, from the oak aging. So yeah, what did we say? Yeah, just 24 months. So yeah, that it's been 24 months in barrel. So yeah, that's why I'm not really seeing any oxidation. I'm not smelling any oxidation. Um, it's still fresh. And that, that much oak, yeah, you're going to get, you're going to get some things like that. Yes, you may hear background noise in this episode too. Or not, because the noise reduction I use is pretty badass, actually. Every time I think you're going to hear background noise from either recording during the day or the train at night or rain happening, I'm super surprised when I even listen to headphones that it's really not there. Kind of crazy. Let's taste it. I, I could smell this wine actually for longer, but let's taste it. It's super tasty. It's got the rusticity though. So... If I was knowing ahead of time or in a blind, but if I knew ahead of time this was San Giovese and someone goes, tell me where, I would I would really start thinking about uh, Montepulciano. I really would. Um, there's a denseness to it. There's, there's a, it, it's denser than Chianti. Okay, but it's not as dense and it's not as tannic. It's not as big. And a lot of times multiple, I'm sorry, Brunello can be juicier, more, f not fruit forward, but the, the fruit is more prominent and um, uh, sometimes, I wouldn't call it jammy, but like just bigger. Um, but then the tannin will just hit you. Uh, whereas Chianti and Nobile, uh, you know, Montepulciano, it, they don't, the tannin doesn't hit the same way. It's there. I notice it, but the fruit is drier. Um, it's almost desiccated, um, not not dried like raisinated, but like just dried fruit. The non-fruit characteristics are what are what really are coming through. I've got forest floor. I've got garage. I've got um, kind of stems like like branches, bark type of thing going on here. Um, fern, sage. I mean, this, this wine needs food. Like, yeah, I mean, I could drink any wine on its own, but this wine needs food. Um, doesn't help that I'm freaking starving because it's around lunchtime. Um, but, you know, so my not only is my mouth watering because Sangiovese is one of the grapes that really retains acidity. That's why it goes really great with pasta sauce or you know tomato sauce because you you have that. It's not that, it's not that they the two together take them together. It's not that the, the it's not the you know they sum together they add together to make something higher. It's that they complement each other. It's an equality thing here. Um, that's why with tomatoes. Uh, northern Northern Italian wines, especially, which is kind of funny because Northern Italian Northern Italy didn't is not known for red sauce. It's a Southern Italian thing. I mean, granted, now they have it up there. They're more known for white sauce, but even then, if you're doing a creamy sauce, a creamier sauce, the acidity and the tannin 
has has all this fat to play with. You know, cheesy sauces. Now you could totally do this with Alfredo. Like that's what I had. What I had at, at lunch, everyone had like this rigatoni that I always have, has red sauce and sausage and meatballs. I had basically a chicken sausage Alfredo sauce, uh, Alfredo dish. And then Amaroni went great with it too. And I don't do that very often, like a like a dense red wine with with a with a, like a white well, something you would associate with white um, a white wine with, but because that was a the is a fettuccine, it's a thick pasta, it's a thick sauce. You've got the chicken, but you also got some. You also got the um, sausage in there. A red wine, the body of the red wine really is kind of required. If I, if I had like Pinot Grigio with it or Pecorino or any other type of Italian white or even just other other just white wines, they would have been weak. It would not have matched up. Um, I talk about this in other things with sake, um, Japanese culture. They they think about body and not necessarily like protein. OK, um, so if a red wine is appropriate for the dish that you would maybe think a white wine would be, they go with that. If If a white wine. If, if a red wine seems appropriate just on our rules, but it's lighter in style, they may go white wine with it. Anyway, and that leather felt and dust is coming through. It's, it's, it's dusty. It's dirty. Um, it's, it's earthy. It's, it's earthy. And it's got like that bark, that bitter root. Um, it, it, it also kind of tastes like an Amaro. So, there's a bitterness to it that's like like having some type of amaro or even like um, even like a a red vermouth that's not so vermouth is kind of sweet but if you have like one of those amaros it's kind of like that it's excellent not quite fernet branca or fernet um, level uh, bitterness but it, it's kind of there it's good all right going to do it for today's show. If you enjoy what I'm doing here, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. Maybe give a little tickle on the way out um, and then tell your friends and we'll see you next time. Maybe with some Vino Nibile Monte Cucciano. Cheers or salud.